to 2030. Um, and then I put at the bottom there, what a long, strange trip it's been so far. Um, because it's really great to be out with everyone and to see you all again. Um, but first, I'll mention a little bit about Perkins and Will. We're a global firm. Uh, we're in 26 studios. We're uh, 2,600 uh, designers uh, focused on many different types of work. And my team's charge is to affect all that work. Um, not that we're focused on just the top 10% um, projects that are around design excellence or healthcare or CI, it's, it's all the projects. So we have this complexity of scale. Anything that we're trying to do, we're always trying to scale to all of our projects uh, and to all of our clients. So like I said, it's been a while. Uh, you might remember back in 2020, it was a new decade. We we're all really excited. Uh, we wrote this big blog post about what we thought was going to happen in the next 10 years. Um, we're thinking we're going to move things to the cloud. We're going to collaborate with a lot of people. Um, and then a few short months later, uh, yeah, this happened. And we all kind of went to work from home and it didn't feel very good. But we got on with it. And this is a graph that I like to show. I go back and show this to my team. Uh, pretty often. Um, in March of 2020, we took something that we thought was going to take till the end of the year, uh, and we did it in about three weeks, and that was to move everyone to be able to be fully remote, remote our projects, uh, so people could work from anywhere, and we could deliver for our clients, um, and we did not miss one single deadline. And I found this to be really empowering, that you can make change really fast in a large organization, um, with a lot of people working together. So I kind of bring this back and when our team says, that's gonna take six months. I'm like, I think it should take three weeks because we've done it before and we can do it again. So what has that changed in, in terms of how we're thinking about the next eight years? You know, we have these really major challenges, um, uh, housing crisis across, across the globe. How will we address that? Um, climate crisis. How are we going to address that? These are things that weigh on us and our clients, uh, and I think as designers and as, as architects, how, how are we going to make these changes to, to better everyone? And that, you know, 2030 will be here really quickly. Uh, and to put that in perspective with technology, that's eight short years. Um, in 2006, which was 16 years ago, you know, this happened, the iPhone happened. And how much has changed in 16 years? Technology is definitely moving at 2x. And the reason I bring this up is what we hear back from the folks in our studio is there's been too much change in the last two years. There's been too much that we've had to deal with. And we have to repeatedly go back and say, it's not going to slow down. We probably have to speed up. So we have to get comfortable with this change and the tools if we want to make real uh, difference in the world. So in the last few months, uh, my team and our research team uh, have come up with this kind of mantra that we're using, and that's that we're a collective, a collective of designers who harness technology to unlock new value for humans and the planet. It's not technology for technology's sake, it's to make a better experience for everyone. And that what we've learned is that we can be bold and go fast, and we need to do that. And I think the last example is to partner up. And I wanna talk about three projects that we've done in, in, two, in the last two years through the pandemic that really started like right in 2020. Uh, and we've brought them to the firm and we've been sharing them inside and outside of the firm and it's through amazing partnerships that we've been able to make like with James here. Uh, I'll stole some of his slides. So the first one I'll talk about, uh, drawings are good. I think they're amazing. Um, and we can learn a whole lot from them. There's a company called AI Prentice. Uh, it's a really small startup out on the West Coast. Um, we started talking to them in January of 2020 about what can we do in our process to, to automate this? What can we do with what we have that's existing already? And one of the things that became kind of a breakthrough for us was to say, we know the models that we create as designers to deliver are not very good. We've talked about that, I think, a lot today. There's a lot of unstructured data. Uh, people aren't doing things consistently. And when we took a step back, we said, you know, it's kind of consistent um, is the drawing sets. 
they are structured. Uh, people tag everything in there because we build from those. Um, and that if we could start to extract the data from our drawing sets, that we could then index those in a database um, and then apply Elasticsearch. This is all going to AWS um, and then put them into the web for our designers to go back and look at. And we call this artifact. Um, we launched this, I think, in December of last year. Um, it's actually a product. You can buy this from AI Prentice. I wholly endorse that. Um, but what's been getting really interesting is, you know, this is an old video. Now we're over 100,000 uh, drawings in there. Um, what we're starting to find is what's being repeated because we can use computer vision and the metadata behind all the drawings to say, we, we sure do do a lot of the same drawings over and over again. How can we save time? How can we reuse those to make time to do the things that are really important. What I think in listening to the, the talks today, which I think are, are excellent, is you know what kind of comes next. So you put this in there, you use it, you put it back in the project, now it goes back in the database, but what if you replaced Elasticsearch with stable diffusion? And instead of creating these really beautiful uh, rendered images, we can prompt for design solutions for details. <coughs> Um, and things that are in the drawing sets. Again, to really save time in the production where most of the time happens um, to do higher value work like um, LCA and carbon calculations, things that'll make a difference to our clients in the future. Second uh, project I'd like to talk about, we, we'd call this modeling intelligence or model intelligence. This is a collaboration with uh, Nate Miller in the Proving Ground. I think a lot of folks have seen um, the work that Nate's done with a, a Power BI plugin called Tracer, which we think is really kind of amazing. Um, it takes something from uh, Revit and Rhino and puts it in a place that is more accessible to our stakeholders. And we collaborated, collaborated with Nate and the team to um, take some of the code and build out a tool to extract from 26 studios into the cloud. Um, so what we saw as a challenge really is that we have a lot of people that are the, the, the folks in the team called, you know, the, the planners, they're planning the work, large hospitals, um, office buildings, things like that. And they're working in Excel essentially. So you have this one data set that's at one side. And then you have the folks modeling and designing in Rhino and Revit and that's where we think of simple business terms you have the plan versus the actual but there's actually no easy way to compare that without doing a whole bunch of work uh, especially if like james is saying there's a team spread out across the world so we needed a way to bring those together and what we originally thought was well we've put everything in bin 360 now we should be able to extract that really easily um, that's not the case um, so we had to come up with another solution and think goodness, there's people like the Proving Ground and Nate that are making some of these solutions. But once we have that, what's become really interesting is we create a dashboard that our stakeholders um, can use, our clients and um, the leadership on the project who have never had a, a, a view into this in almost real time, right? So if the client calls and says, how large is this building? How big are we now? They actually can't answer, like without doing calling someone else and having them open the rabbit model and getting a schedule and then putting in Excel and comparing against the program. Um, this happens every day at scale. So right now we have about 200 projects running this um, and it updates every night or on demand. One of the things that we were trying to solve also is I think everyone in this room knows, you know, getting good data, you all see this uh, bad data in or bad data out or whatever. I, I don't really like that. Um, saying, but what we look, we took a step back and said like, hey, everyone really seems to like their Fitbits and Apple watches. Somehow everyone's walking around like 10,000 steps a day. And the way that you do that is to form a habit, right? Um, and you measure it every day and you try to adjust to that. So we ran this experiment about a year ago where we were doing these daily uh, syncs and, and then went back and showed the team, like this is how your gross square footage is changing day in and day out. And when they were starting to take a look at this, they're like, oh, we know what day that was. We had a meeting, so we poured all this stuff into the model. 
um, this is when we got an initial cost. We took it all back out. Um, and that's what we're trying to avoid is these cliffs. As we creep through the project, we really want to avoid rework. We want to avoid VE. That's like bad iteration as I think we were calling it last night. So this is a way of us trying to understand how often do we have to sink? How often do we have to push this all back out to the team to make a difference? And then also to validate the data. So if they see something that's not right, they'll change it. And it's not a big change. It's just a very simple change. And then we thought, well, we have this database that's running in the cloud. We can then start to apply cost, uh, living design data or resiliency data, uh, healthy building network data, our benchmarking data, uh, everything else can be in there. If that's where the source of truth is, we have it in a modern stack that we can work from. And it's pretty simple. Um, this is our kind of um, MVP at the end of last year before we really started kicking in. Um, we took a small project with the design team uh, and this is what we were syncing out every night. There's an Excel file, there's a Revit file, they feed into our database and then they're compared in Power BI. The reason we're using Power BI right now is every client is different and wants something else, right? So we can't, we don't have enough development um, power on our team to write this all out in uh, D3. So we allow the design team to go in and, and start to customize this. There, there needs to be flexibility uh, to make this work. And then we think it can get kind of interesting where if this simple model um, is almost the DNA of what could become a digital twin, that's whatever the client defines that as, but that they can layer in their building system data, IoT and scheduling. Where we wanna bring this further is data on demand, where they need it, where the team needs it. Um, we see cost coming into this, building out cost models from the benchmarking and the data that we feed back in from our estimators. Uh, and then really the big one is around embodied carbon, operational carbon. So our teams are always talking about, we wanna go back and benchmark. And what we've been saying to them is stop going backwards, go forward. In 12 months, if we all use this tool, we'll have more data than we've ever had before. Uh, and that's the journey that we're on right now. We call it area sync. Um, so that's, that's been out in production now for, um, since the beginning of the year really, but we're moving that up. Uh, the third um, piece of work I wanna talk about is a mantra that we had within the firm around what we would call deliver different. Um, how can we start to deliver our projects differently? Uh, and luckily, you know, we had a relationship with Zaner uh, and with the team to say, how, how do we do this? How do we institutionalize this? Not on a project or two projects, every project, what can we learn and what can we instill and put into our design teams? Um, and we really started to take a look at the process, but we had these, these goals that we wanted to reach and it was change the industry. You know, and that's why we're here talking about these things. Um, develop a digital first process of design and delivery. James was showing, I think beyond. Uh, and then, short circuit some of it. We want to chase work with Zaner and win work. We don't want to do it even just with a GC. We want to deliver the design and you know the best possible outcomes. We think we can do that together. We can think about the business model a little bit differently. This is a diagram uh, that talks about uh, where is the sweet spot? How do you find that? And you know if you ever worked on a project without um, working with a fabricator or closely with a, a cost estimator, you're kind of flying in, in the dark. Uh, you may be able to hit two of these, but you're never gonna hit the third. And that's where having a really close relationship with uh, a fabricator, especially like Zaner, um, comes into play. And we thought about how can we continuously shrink um, the communication gap? So this is you know what it is today. So typically, you, know, you send something out, someone says, yeah, it's okay, you can send it out. Um, the team receives it, they make comments, they send it back. And what we really wanted to do was have this even flow, have a common um, data exchange playing field uh, to share information. So we've built out templates that we share, uh, Rhino files that we share, uh, and have built tools together so that very quickly we can go from a concept and within literally hours, get back you know, constructability and pricing. 
So these are some of the tools that uh, the team's built in, like James said, folks that built these are gonna be at the hackathon this weekend. Um, I'm gonna go pretty quick here. You'll find unique panels. These are all things that um, experts know, but maybe architects working on the models don't know. Um, and it's not telling them they can't do something, but it's just letting them know there may be a better way. This is my favorite, if it fits, it ships. Um, how is things gonna fit on a truck? Um, and if you think about this in the long term, it's like, if we use less trucks, we probably use less carbon. That seems like a good thing. This is just uh, quickly um, a little project that's up in Toronto um, that was worked on through the pandemic in the beginning here, working with the indigenous uh, design group. Um, and we were told about this story of something called a star blanket. Um, and we took that concept and we built this, um, this model here. We had this very heavy felt. We scanned this and this is before we met with the team at Sainer and it was like, how, how are we gonna do this? And we introduced them to the team. We set up the platform with Zayner. Uh, and I think this neighborhood that really is an under, underserved part of Toronto is gonna get this really beautiful uh, jewel box. Um, this is what that will look like. This is a white paper that we put together. This is available on our websites. And the questions come up um, and there's, there's a presentation of this going on right now in LA, actually. Uh, why, why are we sharing this? And it goes back to that uh, goal. You know, We wanna raise all the ships. We wanna change how we're delivering work um, so we can be better stewards of the environment and deliver for our clients. So this is something that a colleague of mine wrote um, in Vancouver last week when we were together talking about the future will, will belong to firms that are able to harness technology and data to their advantage, uh, but should change this and said, you know, for the good of people on our planet. And I think that technology is that vehicle that can get us there, especially with you know, how many smart people we have in this room and the firms that we represent. And that we can all be bold, go fast, and uh, partner up with one another. Thanks.